Gospel according to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. <coughs> well, I read with a little chagrin this past week uh, a post from Pastor Candace on Facebook where she uh, kind of self-divulged that uh, when looking at a clock at a, her ancestral church in Sweden, she admitted that she feels anxious when the service runs over an hour. Immediately that made me anxious because last Sunday when I preached, <laughs> I know that I owe you like seven minutes. So we're gonna shoot for 9.53 today. <laughs> what a treat to be here again. It's always a joy to be at faith, knowing of all that you are doing in Jesus' name, engaged in the community and really engaged in the world. So thank you for that. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. This past week, I was rummaging around in my home office bookshelves looking for a book that I was sure was there, though I still haven't found it. But what I did find was a big, blue, familiar book simply called Pastoral Record. It was an ordination gift from the senior pastor of the first congregation I served, a ledger book of sorts, where a pastor could write down all the names and dates of important church events that that pastor is involved with, like baptisms and funerals and weddings. Oops, was I supposed to be working? Talk about your major distractions when I opened that book. I haven't been doing so many pastoral acts like that in the six years that I've been in a new position with the ELCA. So I couldn't help but look back and think back, especially to the long list of couples that I've married over the years, a couple hundred couples in total. Honestly, there were a lot of names there from the late 80s and the 1990s that I didn't really remember anymore. But then there were also those that I am certain I will never forget, believe me, Believe me, for every nice, mature, well-suited couple, there was another that everybody had their doubts about. I think of one wedding, for example, early in my career, when the bride and groom were 40 years apart in age. Or the couple who called the day before the wedding to see if I'd still be willing to perform the wedding even if the bride's divorce wasn't quite finalized. <laughs> well, of course, hope springs eternal, right? And on that wedding day, you want nothing more than the couple's happiness to last forever. You can never be sure how things are going to turn out. Some of the couples, honestly, that I was most concerned about are doing so very well today. I think of the one couple I married, 
both of them having just finished their PhDs, both of them about to start their teaching careers at universities. Trouble is, his university was in New York and hers was in California. So I asked them, you're going to start your marriage 3,000 miles apart? Yes, we are, they answered, and we'll be all right. Real love doesn't know distance. Real love doesn't know distance. You know, I kind of like that. I've hung on to that. It's really true, I suppose. I see it in my own life. I think about my parents, for example. Yeah, for 18 years we lived in the same house long ago, but now we live 400 miles apart. Do we love each other any less? No. If anything, we appreciate our time together all the more. We're still family. And you know we'd travel the distance at a moment's notice if something happened to somebody. And friends who are far away, the ones we really care for, do we love them any less because of, because of the distance that separates us? No. Real love doesn't know distance. Real love is blind to geography. So this couple on opposite ends of the continent, they may still be doing just fine. And may their reunions be joyous, I say. After all, they're family now. Together, just one single unit. One flesh, the Bible says. Even though they may be physically divided, Think about that imagery for a moment. Two people, one flesh. Pretty amazing, pretty miraculous what shared love can do. St. Paul mentions a similar phenomenon in our second reading today. Paul describes for us how we are all individual parts of what? One body, one unit. A single, though physically divided. In a sense, it's as if all Christians are married together, joined together in the mystical union of the faith we share, the love of God we share. You, people of faith, you've experienced the truth in this image. Is it not true that if someone we love in the congregation is sick or hurting or grieving, do we not all feel that pain? Or if someone is celebrating, don't we all feel that joy as well? As Christians in this community of faith, we are all one body. And what we know and feel and do is shared by all that body. God's love binds us into a single unit, a single unit with the title of Christian Church. So you'll get no arguments from us on this, St. Paul. Church is a special place. Once we're rooted in a congregation, a lot of us love the snuggly warm feeling we get when we're together. We look forward to Sunday mornings. And when we have to move away, or others move away, well, we miss them. Every pastor knows what it's like to run into a former church member now living somewhere else, and those people say how they miss their church. They miss worshiping together. They name this person and that and ask them how everybody is doing. And it's a little wonder that they think about you from far away. After all, they are together with us, one body in Christ, bound by love and real love, friends, doesn't know distance. Okay, since we all agree on these things so far, 
I'm trusting. Let's go a step further. Because guess what? As always, there's a challenge in all this. And the challenge is this. That there are members of our body who are suffering today. And it just might be possible that we could be doing something about it. Let me ask you, those of you who are married, if you knew that your husband or wife wasn't eating enough, would you do something about it? Or if you have children, consider this. If your son or daughter had moved away to another city and you just found out that they couldn't afford a place to live and they were sleeping in their car every night, would you do something to intervene? Or if you have elderly parents and you found out that in the past six months no one had come to see them, would you hurry to be there? Well, of course, I know you would. I know that you would not let your own family suffer without doing everything you could to make it better. And it wouldn't matter where they lived, would it? You would go wherever you needed to go to make sure that things were taken care of because family is family after all and real love doesn't know distance. We would want to know these things and we would want to do anything and everything in our power to make sure that any suffering within our family is dealt with and quickly. Well, sadly enough, friends, the fact is that there are members of our family who aren't getting enough to eat these days. And there are children sleeping in cars or tents or cardboard shelters. And there are elders who are lonely and young people struggling with addictions. And the list goes on and on. In truth, in Jesus' world, Everyone is our neighbor. Everyone is our kin. In Jesus' world, the man who sleeps on the street is our own flesh and blood. The woman searching through the trash for food is our own sister, our own mother, our own daughter. This is our family we're talking about. This is our own body. In our gospel reading today, Jesus asks his followers, who do you say that I am? In a powerful way, Jesus is testing them, testing their convictions, challenging them to take a stand, to confess Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God, as Peter did, is to take that stand and to acknowledge a willingness to join Jesus' world. It's a proclamation of one's willingness to be married, if you will, married to the body of Christ, to be bound by love to all of God's children, no matter their wealth, no matter where they live or how they live, to confess Jesus as the Messiah is to proclaim a willingness to do all that we can to ensure that all of our family is cared for. All of our family is fed. All of our family is visited. All of our family is safe. And because real love knows no distance, friends, it's not just the person in the next pew or the next block, or the next town that matters. (coughs) But just as much those in far-off lands, those suffering from war, or oppression, or famine, or natural disaster, each person is God's child, and each one deserves our love and care, and our greatest effort. 
Today, our Lord stands before each of us and asks the question again, who do you say that I am? It's said that actions speak louder than words. So another way to phrase the question might be, who do your actions say that I am? To our Lord Jesus, who loves every single one of us, so much that he gave his very life to redeem us. Our actions can shout out our gratitude by sharing our love with those who need it so desperately. Giving blood, tutoring a child, collecting canned food, writing a check, Encouraging a student, serving on a community board, donating a book, offering a hand. Every one of these things can be a proclamation of faith, every bit as profound and important as the Apostles' Creed. Who do you say that I am, Jesus says. God grant us the desire and the courage to boldly proclaim Jesus as our Lord and Savior in all that we do. Every moment of our lives, it is our duty and our privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>